Good evening aspirants, welcome to the Hindu News Analysis Session by Shankar IAS Academy for the date 22nd January 2022. Today we have an important announcement. Shankar IAS Academy has designed a refresher course called as CSAT Plus. See some aspirants though they score good marks in GS paper in prelims, they find it very challenging to qualify in the Civil Service Aptitude Test Paper shortly called as the CSAT paper. To help students to easily qualify for the CSAT, Shankar IAS Academy has come up with this course which starts on 27th January 2022. The class time will be between 5.30 pm to 8 pm. The program is also available in online mode. The admission is now open and by joining one will get these benefits. To register for the program visit the link given in the description below. These are the list of articles we will be discussing today. Now let us start today's discussion. Look at this news article. The news article talks about a seagrass species named Holodule uninervis. This species is found to have a strong anti-cancer activity and it is scientifically evident from the ethyl acetate fraction of this Holodule uninervis. This is found in the coastal regions of Mandabam close to Rameshwaram in southern Tamil Nadu. So in this context, let us discuss about some basics about seagrass like its habitat in India, its significance and finally let's see the threats faced by seagrass. The syllabus for this discussion is highlighted here. Now let's start our discussion. First, what are seagrass? Seagrass are underwater plants that evolved from land plants. So when compared with the terrestrial plants or land plants, they have few things in common. Like terrestrial plants, they have leaves, flowers, seeds roots and connective tissues. Also, they make their food in the presence of sunlight through photosynthesis. Note that they undergo submarine pollination where the pollen is carried through the water to fertilize female flowers. And sometimes the seagrass can send out rhizome roots that can sprout new growth. Okay? But the main difference between seagrass and the terrestrial plant is seagrass do not have strong stems to hold themselves up. Instead of stems, seagrass are supported by the buoyancy of water that surrounds them. Just have a look at this picture of seagrass to understand the buoyancy characteristic. Okay, know that the seagrass ecosystem is one of the most widespread coastal vegetation types when compared to coral and mangrove ecosystem. They occur in all the coastal areas around the world except the polar region. Now, just have a look at this map which shows the seagrass spread in India. It is very clear that Indian seagrass habitat are mainly limited to mudflats and sandy regions and it extends from the lower inner tidal zone to the depth of 10 to 15 meter along the open shores. They are also found in the lagoons around islands also. See in India, Gulf of Mannar and Palk Bay has the maximum number of species of seagrass followed by Andaman and Nicobar and the Lakshwadip islands. Now let's see the importance of seagrass. See, firstly, the seagrass help reduce the effects of strong ocean currents. The seagrass also provides a safe environment for eggs and larvae to attach. See, these factors make seagrass a good nursery area for many fishes and invertebrates. Secondly, the seagrass produce energy through photosynthesis. Hence, they are very sensitive to water quality. This is because when the water is clear, more sunlight penetrates into the water thereby enhancing photosynthesis. So, it is said that seagrass are an indicator of the overall health of the coastal ecosystem. Thirdly, the seagrass provide food for herbivores like sea turtles and manatees. Note that not only when they are alive, but even the dead seagrass provide food for decomposers like worms, sea cucumbers, crabs and bottom feeders. Also, organisms like plankton, algae and bacteria grow on the stem of the seagrass. See, fifthly, they improve water quality. This is done by trapping sediments, absorbing nutrients and stabilizing sediments with their roots. So, the seagrass are called the ecosystem engineers. The sixth main importance is its capacity to sequester carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. This ability makes seagrass act as carbon sinks. Next, these seagrass are known as warriors of ocean acidification as they always cause an increase in pH value. Why? Because CO2 is withdrawn from the water column through photosynthesis of the seagrass. Thereby, the protons associated with the carbonic acid is also removed. So, when there is a presence of seagrass, the ocean acidity comes down. 
okay thereby seagrass can help fight ocean acidification above all a variety of medicines and chemicals are also prepared from seagrass okay now having done with the basics and the significance of seagrass now let us see some of the major threats faced by seagrass first is sea level rise sea level rise causes coastal modification sea level rise also reduces the penetration of sunlight thus affecting the photosynthesis potential of seagrass the second important threat is global changes in atmospheric co2 concentration and water temperature see this change in co2 concentration and water temperature affects the seagrass negatively the next is the issue of erosion and siltation erosion and siltation results in hydrologic modification causing destruction of sand dunes and coastal zones which are the main habitat for seagrass in addition to this eutrophication caused by excess nutrients or sewage discharge affects the growth of seagrass anthropogenic activities like destructive fishing coastal development like ports navigation channels shipbuilding yards anchoring of boats etc all threaten the survival of seagrass finally seagrass are also threatened by the increased growth of invasive species like seaweeds okay see these are some major threats faced by seagrass due to the greater significance of seagrass indian government has taken few initiatives to enhance the growth of seagrass through a project called community supported management and conservation strategies for seagrass beds in palk bay see through this project the indian government is taking steps to conserve seagrass in the palk bay area the main objective of this project is to economically evaluate the benefits of seagrass and to develop a community based management and conservation strategies to optimize the wise use of seagrass beds also the union ministry of environment forest and climate change organizes conference which discuss the measures to conserve seagrass species see in this discussion we saw some basic points about seagrass its distribution in india its significance the threats faced by seagrass and finally some steps taken by the indian government to conserve seagrass with this let us conclude this discussion and now let us take up the next news article for our discussion look at this editorial this editorial talks about the india german relationship indo german ties are in news because the german navy frigate bayan landed in mumbai on thursday that is on january 20 2022 it is seen as a remarkable step for indo german relations this is the crux of this article taking this as an opportunity we will learn about indo german relations and the significance of the indo pacific region the syllabus regarding this discussion is highlighted here you can go through it now let us start our discussion See bilateral relations between India and Germany are founded on the common democratic principles and are marked by a high degree of trust and mutual respect. India was amongst the first countries to establish democratic ties with the Federal Republic of Germany after the Second World War. Relations grew significantly following the end of the Cold War and the unification of Germany. In the last decade both economic and political interactions between Germany and India has increased significantly. Today Germany is amongst India's most important partners both bilaterally and in the global context. Now we will see some of the important steps taken by these two countries to improve their relationship. Firstly, India and Germany have a strategic partnership since 2001. See, a strategic partnership is a long-term interaction between two countries based on political economical social and historical factors the strategic partnership has been further strengthened with the intergovernmental consultations at the level of head of the governments the fifth intergovernmental consultations was held in delhi on november 1 2019 during which 21 mous were signed this includes diverse areas of engagement including some of the new and emerging areas such as artificial intelligence space smart cities and urban green mobility okay second is with respect to economic and commercial relations see germany is india's largest trading partner in europe it has consistently been among india's top 10 global partners and was the eighth largest trading partner in the financial year 2019-20 germany is also the seventh largest fdi source for india the cumulative fdi from germany to india since april 2000 is over 12.9 billion us dollars As per Indo-German Chamber of Commerce, there are more than 1,700 German companies in India. 
German investments in India have been mainly in sectors of transportation, electrical equipments, metallurgical industries, service sector, insurance sector, chemicals, construction activity, trading and automobiles. Thirdly, in respect to science and technology, there has been more than 150 joint science and technology research projects and 70 direct partnerships between universities of both countries. Note that ISRO has launched 11 German satellites since 1999. Fourth step is with respect to multilateral cooperation. C. Germany and India support each other on UNSC expansion within the framework of the G4. C. The G4 nations are Brazil, Germany, India and Japan. These G4 nations support each other's bid for the permanent seat on the United Nations. Germany, as a chair of NSG, played a constructive role in Vienna in 2008, which approved India-specific waiver to enable civil nuclear cooperation with India. Also, Germany extended support to India's candidature for export control regimes like the Westerner Agreement and the Australia Group. Note that Germany also voted in favor of Pakistan's inclusion in the grey list of the Financial Action Task Force in June 2018. Germany joined the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, CDRI, in February 2020 and participated in the first Governing Council meeting in March 2020. In April 2021, the German Federal Cabinet approved the signing of the Amended Framework Agreement of the International Solar Alliance and thereby German's accession to the International Solar Alliance. And finally, the relationship got stronger with Indian diaspora. There are more than 1,90,000 Indian passport holders and Indian origin people in Germany. The Indian diaspora mainly consists of professionals, businessmen, traders, nurses and students. There has been an increase in the last few years in the number of qualified Indian professionals in the fields of IT, banking and finance. Having discussed the steps taken by India and Germany, now we will discuss about the significance of the Indo-Pacific region for these two countries. See, Germany has realized that world's political and economic center of gravity is to a large degree shifting to the Indo-Pacific region. See, the Indo-Pacific region is a biogeographic region of Earth's seas comprising of the tropical waters of the Indian Ocean, the Western Pacific and the Central Pacific Ocean. India's definition of Indo-Pacific region stretches from the western coast of North America to the eastern shores of Africa. Here, Germany considers India as a key player a strategic partner and a long-standing democratic friend. In September 2020, the German government laid out its Indo-Pacific guidelines, listing its interest and commitment to the region where India is a key protagonist. Why? Because India is a maritime superpower and a strong advocate for free and inclusive trade. This is a region whose importance has been obvious to India for a very long time. Now, let us see why the countries are concerned about the Indo-Pacific region. See, this is because Indo-Pacific region is home to around 65% of the global population and 20 of the world's 33 megacities. The region also accounts for 62% of the global GDP and 46% of the world's merchandise trade. On the other hand, it is also the source of more than half of the global carbon emissions. See, this makes the region's countries key partners in tackling global challenges such as climate change and sustainable energy production and consumption. Also, both India and Germany are concerned about the growing influence of China in this region. See, the heart of India's economic ties in the Indo-Pacific is rooted in the Indian Ocean. The Indian Ocean is almost 20% of the world's ocean area, touching shores of 36 countries and connecting three continents, that is Africa, Asia and Australia, and the Indian Ocean has a total coastline of 66,526 kilometers or 40% of the global coastline. The Indian Ocean is home to major sea lanes and choke points that are crucial to global trade, connecting major centers of international economy in the Northern Atlantic and the Asia Pacific region. Around 90,000 commercial shipping vessels form the backbone of the international goods trade in the Indo-Pacific region. Also, about 40% of the world's oil supply travels to the strategic choke points in the Indo-Pacific region. The Indian Ocean is also a valuable source of mineral and fishing resources. 
கரண்ட்லி வித் இன் த இண்டியன் ஓஷன் ரீஜன் ஈஸ்ட் ஏஷியா அண்ட் த பெசிபிக் அவுட் பெர்ஃபார்ம் சவுத் ஏஷியா வெஸ்ட் ஏஷியா அண்ட் ஆப்ரிக்கா ஆன் ஆல் ஆஸ்பெக்ட்ஸ் ஆஃப் எக்கனாமிக்ஸ் ஆஃப் த இண்டியன் ஓஷன் ஸோ இந்தியாஸ் எக்கனாமிக் ஃபியூச்சர் வில் பி இன் த இண்டோ பெசிபிக் ரீஜன் This will largely be defined by India's capacity to build on its blue economic potential which ranges across several sectors. Also, it will be defined by regional economic integration like trade agreements to address trade barriers and connectivity infrastructure to promote intra and inter-regional trade in the Indian Ocean. In case of Germany, the Indo-Pacific region is important because more than 20% of German trade is conducted in the Indo-Pacific neighborhood. This is why Germany and India share a responsibility to maintain and support stability, prosperity and freedom in the Indo-Pacific region. Millions of jobs in Germany depend on these trade and investment relations. So, the security and stability of the Indo-Pacific is crucial for both India and Germany. Other than Indo-Pacific, another urgent area of possible Indo-German cooperation is infrastructure. See, India is one of the few countries that has managed to consciously and deliberately stay out of the Belt and Road Initiative promoted by China. So, both Germany and India could pursue routes to connect India and the European Union and do this via clean energy projects that both sides have a huge interest in. See, Germany also has concerns about unreliable supply chains mainly after pandemic and the lockdown-induced supply chain disruption. Germany also has concerns in key sectors such as 5G and pharmaceuticals. See, in all these areas, India can complement Germany and this offers enormous potential for fruitful cooperation. And finally, India and Germany should step up their cooperation to tackle common challenges with special focus on climate change. Germany cooperates with India to the tune of 1.3 billion euros a year in development projects. Of the 1.3 billion euros, 90% of it serves the purpose of fighting climate change, saving natural resources and also promoting clean and green energy. Another crucial point to note is that what world leaders agreed upon in the COP26 in Glasgow, Germany and India are putting the discussion into practice. Okay? So, before concluding the discussion, in this segment, we discussed about the steps taken in the Indo-Pacific relations and the definition of the Indo-Pacific, the significance of the Indo-Pacific for both India and Germany and the future cooperation and significance of the Indo-German relations. With this, let us conclude this discussion. Now we will move on to the next news article. Look at this news article. This piece of news article is about a new Android app. This new Android app has been launched for Greater Chennai Police Personnel to apply for leave and to get it sanctioned immediately. The name of the app is CLAP, that is Complete Leave App. It was unveiled by the Chief Minister of Tamil Nadu yesterday. So, in the context of this article, let us see some issues faced by the police forces and the various committee recommendations regarding police reforms. First, the syllabus relevant to this article is highlighted here for your reference. Please go through it. Let us start our discussion by looking at the problems faced by the police personnel. Let us see them one by one. First in the list is the excessive burden and vacancies in the police department. See, police officers perform a variety of tasks including crime prevention and crime response, internal security, law and order and various other responsibilities like traffic management, disaster rescue and removal of encroachment etc. Apart from this, each police officer is also responsible for a huge group of people. See, India has a low police strength per lakh population and in comparison to international standards. India's sanctioned strength is 181 police per lakh people compared to UN suggested standard of 222 police per lakh people. As a result, the average police officer ends up with a massive burden and extended working hours which hurts his or her efficiency and performance. Apart from this, a high percentage of vacancies in police department increases the already existing problem of overworked officers. C. Understaffing leads to overburdening of work which reduces the effectiveness and efficiency of the police officers. This leads to poor investigation quality. The overburdened workforce coupled with ineffective investigation leads to increased case pendency. In addition to this, excessive burden also causes psychological distress to police personnel. This psychological distress is leading to police excess. Okay? It also leads to alcoholism and other negative impacts among the police personnel. 
The second issue is the lack of proper infrastructure. See, for effective modern policing, cutting-edge communication technology, modern weapons and good transportation facility which helps in mobility is required. In India, there is no proper infrastructure like this. This was highlighted by the CAG report and the BPRD report, that is Bureau of Police Research and Development report. The weapons used by the lower police forces are old and cannot match the modern weaponry used by the antisocial elements. Apart from this, the CAG discovered that numerous state police departments' weaponry are remnants of colonial police forces. In addition to this, the purchase process for firearms is lengthy and resulting in a scarcity of arms and ammunition with the police department. The police department faces other issues like limited supply of police vehicle. Sometimes, even short supply of drivers can have an adverse impact on police response time and as a result, their effectiveness in solving cases. See, the government have been allocating funds for improving the infrastructure of police department. But the issue here is that these funds are underutilized. Now moving to the third issue. The third issue is the relationship between police and public. See, effective policing requires a strong focus on police-public relations. But people view the police as inefficient, corrupt and violent due to which the relationship between them has a severe lack of confidence. Most people believe police to be abusive and also believe that police personnel misuse their power in order to bring order to society. This leads to a problem of less coordination due to which the police find it difficult to perform their function. See, this mistrust is the reason why people do not or the public do not appear as eyewitness. This in turn is leading to increase of case pendency. So, effectively, this mistrust has to be addressed. To address the issues faced by the police department, the government has formed various committees. Let us see some committees and their important recommendations in today's discussion. Okay? First is the Padbanabaya Committee on Police Reforms. This committee was set up by the Union Ministry of Home Affairs in 2000. The first recommendation is to increase the number of sub-inspectors instead of constables. To make this happen, the committee recommended to restrict the recruitment of constable till a sub-inspector to constable ratio of 1 is to 4 is achieved. At present, the ratio ranges from 1 is to 7 and in extreme cases in some states, sub-inspector to constable ratio is 1 is to 15. Okay? Secondly, the constables must be retrained. They must be retrained to help them build a right attitude. As per the recommendation of Padmanabhaya committee, those constables who do not successfully complete the training process should be compulsorily retired. See, this training process will help address the public police mistrust. Finally, according to the report, every police station should have investigation kits and every subdivision should have a mobile forensic science laboratory. This will help improve investigation process and in turn help reduce case pendency. The Home Ministry again in 2000 constituted another committee. This committee was headed by Justice V.C. Malaymath, thus called the Malaymath Committee. The task of the committee is simple. It was constituted to examine the functioning of fundamental principles of criminal law to restore confidence in the criminal justice system. The committee made 158 recommendations. Let us see few important provisions of Malaymath Committee report. Firstly, the committee suggested borrowing features from the investigation practiced in countries such as Germany and France. In these systems, a judicial magistrate supervises the investigation. That is, the court will be given the authority to summon anyone for questioning irrespective of the fact that whether they are designated as witness or not. The judicial officer overviews the investigation process. See, this will help prevent police excess during investigation. Now moving on to the second recommendation. See, the panel recommended modification of Article 23 of the Constitution that protects accused from compelled to be a witness against himself or herself. The committee suggested that the court should be given freedom to question the accused to get the necessary information. In case the accused refuses to answer the question, the committee said the courts can draw an adverse inference against the accused. The committee also felt that the accused should be required to file a statement to the prosecution disclosing his or her stand. See, this will help reduce the case pendency and it will also help improve the investigation process. Now the third recommendation. See, the committee also talks about the rights of the accused also. 
according to the committee the criminal code should be published in all regional languages so that the accused is aware of his or her rights the accused should be made aware of how to enforce the rights and whom to approach when the rights are denied to them finally to improve the police investigation process the committee suggested separating the investigation wing from the law and order wing it also recommended setting up of a national security commission and a state security commission to improve the quality of investigation it suggested the appointment of an additional superintendent of police in each district to maintain crime data organization of specialized squads to deal with organized crime and a team of officers to probe interstate or transnational crimes the committee also recommended the setting up of a police establishment board to deal with postings transfer and other aspects of police department c right now the police custody is limited to 15 days the committee suggested this to be extended to 30 days and an additional time of 90 days be granted for filing the charge sheet in case of serious crime see these measures can improve the investigation process of the police department see these are some important recommendations made by the malimath committee see in 1996 a retired indian police service officer named prakash singh has filed a public interest writ petition before the supreme court hoping to free the police from the political control primarily in relation to transfers and postings so the supreme court in the prakash singh versus the union of india 2006 case gave various directives to the government the supreme court gave the following directives you can go through these directives of the supreme court see we can discuss in detail about other important points in police reforms like reberio committee reforms and the model police act 2006 in future discussion so with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article look at this article this article is with reference to nsws that is national single window system which is a digital platform the minister of commerce and industry mr puyush goel said that the nsws should be taken to the indian diplomatic missions across the world in this context we will learn about nsws and its significance now let's start our discussion first of all what is nsws see as we discussed the national single window system is a digital platform this platform is used to guide the investors to identify and to apply for approvals as per their business requirement the platform is built to serve as an advisory tool to identify approvals based on user input kindly note that this platform is to be used for guidance purpose only the national single window system brings together several state governments central ministries and departments onto one platform it provides a one stop solution to investors to apply for approvals and registrations required during the pre establishment and pre operation stages of setting up a business in india see invest india manages the national single window systems project note that invest india is india's national investment promotion and facilitation agency working under the department for promotion for industries and internal trade Invest India is also involved in conceptualizing and designing the portal, onboarding of various ministries and states, maintaining the portal and monitoring the performance of the portal. Now we will see the significance of the NSWS. See, as we discussed, National Single Window System provides a single platform to enable investors to identify and obtain approvals and clearances needed by investors, entrepreneurs and businesses in India. This portal offers a one-stop shop for investors for approval and clearance and all the solutions will be there for all at one click of a mouse through end to end facilitation. This would help in ease of doing business because it would reduce the paperwork, duplication and information asymmetry in different portals because here all the information will be available on a single dashboard. This would bring in transparency, accountability and responsiveness in the ecosystem. So NSWS will provide strength to other important schemes like Make in India, Start up India, and the PLI scheme. See, NSWS works on the Know Your Approvals module. See, the KOA module supports information across 32 central departments and 14 states. Now you may have a question: What is this KOA module? See, Know Your Approval is a user-friendly tool to help you identify central and state government approvals required. 
this service uses an intelligent questionnaire to capture information about your proposed business activities and identifies a indicative list of relevant approvals that may be required to set up your business in India. Again note that the list of approvals indicated by this module is based on user input and shall be used for guidance purpose only and it does not constitute as a legal advice. See in these tables I have given the objectives and services offered by the NSWS. Have a look at it. It will be helpful for your examination. That's all regarding this discussion. Now we will move on to the next news article. Look at this news article. The article says that the Haryana and the Himachal Pradesh governments have signed a memorandum of understanding for the construction of dam in Himachal Pradesh. This move is seen as an attempt to revive the mythical river Saraswati. So in the context, let us briefly understand some of the basics of the Vedic Saraswati river in Plim's perspective. Firstly, we will see where this river is located. The river which had originated from the Kapil Tirtha in the Himalayas in the western Kailash was flowing southwards to Mansarovar and then taking a turn towards west. The river flowed through Haryana, Rajasthan and northern Gujarat. It also flowed through Pakistan before meeting Arabian Sea through Rana of Kutch, and it was approximately 4000 km in length. Don't worry if you have never heard of this river because this river disappeared 5000 years ago due to climatic and tectonic changes. It is believed that river Saraswati is still flowing below the Thar desert and its Himalayan connectivity is still alive. The relict of this lost river is preserved as paleo channels under the cover of desert sand. Here you might have a question. How did they discover the river's presence if it had vanished before 5000 years? See, they used two methods to confirm the river's presence. Firstly, through historical evidence. The name Saraswati has been mentioned in most of the ancient literatures like Vedas, Manu, Mahabharata and Puranas. Second is through remote sensing techniques. See, discovering the exact course of the Vedic Saraswati river and its perennial source is a challenging task among researchers due to lack of proper scientific database. The mystery is unraveled through modern techniques like remote sensing and GIS using multispectral and multi-resolution satellite images of optical and microwave data. ISRO centers could be able to delineate most of the paleo channels of the Vedic Saraswati river and its linkage with the present day Himalayan rivers. See, these are some important points about the Vedic Saraswati river. With this, let us conclude the news article discussion session and take up the practice prelims questions. Today we have three practice prelims question and a previous year question. Let us see them one by one. First, let us take up this question. This question is in regards to seagrass species. Five statements are given. We have to find the incorrect statements. See, this is a statement type question. So, look for the possibility of applying elimination technique. Okay. And also, this question demands for incorrect statements. Note that also. Now, let us take up the first statement. It evolved from land plants. See, this statement is correct. Yes, seagrass evolved from land plants. Now, itself, you can eliminate options C and D. But still, to arrive at the answer, you have to go through the rest of the statements. Now, let us take up the second statement. It is also called seaweeds. See, this statement is absolutely incorrect. Why? Because seaweeds are algae and they are more primitive than seagrass. Note that algae do not have a true root system and they do not have veins that carry molecules through the plant. Algae have spores and do not flower or produce fruit, while seagrass have seeds and fruits. Okay? Now moving on to the third statement. It acts as a carbon sink. This statement is correct because seagrass has a capacity to sequester carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So it can act as a carbon sink. Now let us take up the fourth statement. It is an indicator of the overall health of the coastal ecosystem. See this statement is also correct because seagrasses produce energy through photosynthesis. Hence they are very sensitive to water quality. This is because only when the water is clear, more sunlight penetrates into the water, thereby enhancing photosynthesis. So, it is said that seagrass are an indicator of the overall health of the coastal ecosystem. Now, let us take up the fifth statement. Its IUCN status is critically endangered. See, this statement is incorrect because IUCN status of various seagrass species is least concern. So, the answer here is option A because 
only statement 2 and 5 are incorrect statements now moving on to the second question this is a previous year question which appeared in prelims 2021 let me read out the question which of the following is used in preparing a natural mosquito repellent the options are congress grass elephant grass lemon grass and nut grass here the correct answer is option c lemon grass now let us take up the next question this question is in regards to national single window system or nsws we have to find the incorrect statement let us take up the first statement invest india manages the national single window system projects this statement is correct now moving on to the second statement nsws offers a one stop solution for investors for approval this statement is also correct now moving on to the third statement nsws will provide strength to other schemes like make in india startup india and pli scheme this statement is also correct now moving on to the last statement it shall be used for guidance purpose and also constitute legal advice see this statement is incorrect we have seen this fact that nsws shall be used for guidance purpose only and does not constitute any legal advice since the fourth statement is incorrect the correct answer here is option d now let us take up the last prelims question this question is in regards to saraswati river we have to find the correct statement the first statement is the saraswati is a major rigvedic river mentioned in rigveda and other vedic text this statement is correct now let us take up the second statement it is part of the sapta sindhu rivers mentioned in the rigveda see this statement is also correct it is part of the sapta sindhu rivers mentioned in the rigveda the other rivers are sindhu that is indus sutudri that is satluj vitasta that is jhelum vipasa that is bias ashkini that is chenab and parushni that is ravi so all these rivers are mentioned in rigveda as a part of sapta sindhu rivers so since statement 1 and statement 2 are correct the correct answer here is option c both 1 and 2 The main question based on today's discussion is here write the answers and post it in the comment section actually sorry i was not able to evaluate the answers that i received for the last session i will evaluate the answers today and post my review okay if you like today's discussion like comment and share with your friends and for more updates subscribe to shankar ais academy youtube channel thank you